All right, Alexander, let's do the Q&A from the live stream we did with Larry Johnson. And let's begin with Raphael, who says, guys, from the start, I always let you know that Russia came out alone. And contrary to what everyone else is saying, Russia is not afraid to fight NATO. No, I, well, I mean, they're, they're, they're talking all the time as if they were fighting NATO. And that's essentially what they're saying. I agree with that. I mean, I don't think we should look for a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO because that would be so disastrous, or at least it has the possibilities of spiraling so far out of control that, um, you know, we absolutely would not want to be there. There's a German general, General Vard, who's come out and said exactly that, that this is a disastrous idea for NATO and Russia to get into direct confrontation with each other. But absolutely, I don't think the Russians are afraid of NATO. And not, not in that sense. I think they've seen it exposed in this war in Ukraine, uh, something of a paper tiger. And that's my own view. Raphael also says, for over 20 years, Russia stood and watched the U.S. fighting many wars, and they developed weapons solely to enable them to fight the U.S. when they have to. Yeah. And we're seeing more of them coming on stream now. We've had the Zircon's hypersonic missiles that are now floating around on the latest Admiral Gorshkov frigate. And there's also reports that the Belgorod nuclear submarine is being armed with nuclear powered Poseidon torpedoes, <laughs> all directed, obviously, at the United States. Marilyn, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Chen Ling, thank you for that super chat. Ricardo Alfonso says, great way to start the year. Lorraine Armach says, happy new year, guys. Sanjeva says, happy new year to you, Alexander, Alex, and everybody at the Duran. Thank you, everybody, for all of those super chats. Uh, Gunslinger says, Larry, Larry is the best. Ola Mickelson, thank you for that super chat saying support. And Jax says, I want to clarify that Paul Whelan is not a patriot. He was dishonorably discharged from the Marine Corps for stealing money and social security numbers. The narrative is BS. I know. I, I've seen that. I mean, I've referred to him in that way. And by the way, so have Rush, so have various Russians. But you're absolutely correct. I mean, that is the that is his background. I don't want to talk more about Paul Whelan. I don't want to um, interfere in any way in the um, efforts of his family to try and help him i mean i you know there's a human being whatever whatever he's done or alleged to have done who's involved in all of this but you're absolutely right in what you say paulie says uh, since the west is losing on the battlefield they will dig up another virus thank you for that uh, dimitrios thank you for that super sticker uh, Keith, thank you for that super sticker. Jeffrey Mulford, thank you for that super sticker. Russell Hall says, there's a pretty good movie about the troubled development of the Bradley called The Pentagon Wars, starring Kelsey Grammer and Carrie Yules. Yes, I've heard about it. I haven't seen it. Uh, I've been, you know, a cascade of things about the Bradley from all kinds of different people. In fact, people who have operated them have contacted me directly about it. And I, I'm not saying that it's a lemon or anything like that, but it's clearly a difficult, uh, a difficult machine to use. And the consensus is not one really adapted for Ukrainian conditions. Sanjeva says, we shouldn't put too much credit in Russia's tendency for secrecy either. I can still remember in the Moscow theater siege, they didn't even tell the doctors about antidote to the gas use resulting in many unnecessary deaths. You are completely correct about that. I remember that incident very well. By the way, this is an incident that happened early in Putin's presidency. A group of Chechen uh, um, insurgents, terrorists, came and stormed a theater in Moscow. Uh, held the people hostage. The Russian security forces uh, used a particular chemical substance to basically knock out both the um, terrorists and, of course, in addition, the, the civilians who had been taken hostage were also knocked out as well. Now, that meant that they were able to liberate lots of people and save lots of people, but because they didn't provide the medical authorities with the necessary information and the antidotes, many civilians died who didn't need to die. So that was that was an extraordinary affair. Um, 
um, in some ways, a very tragic affair. And you're absolutely right. I mean, Sanjeev is, Sanjeev is absolutely right. The Russians can take secrecy a lot too far. But in a war like the one we are having now, I think it works to your advantage. I mean, the Russians kept everybody guessing about whether they were going to withdraw their troops from Kherson city or not. Most people assumed that they weren't. I assumed that they weren't. The result is that when they did withdraw them, they were able to withdraw them fully without any interference of the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians were all over the place. And we see the same thing happening. Now, the Russians are clearly planning an offensive and they're getting everybody guessing as to where that offensive is coming from. And that also plays to Russia's advantage. And again, it's a sign that secrecy in war is actually uh, an important tool and the Russians are using it effectively. Hank Kuning, thank you for that super chat. Melissa, thank you for that super sticker. Melkor Orjir says, do you think this change in leadership and expansion of the command staff will result in a Russian declaration of war on Ukraine? No, I don't think so. I think that the Russians will, up to the very moment when they occupy the whole of Ukraine and the Ukrainian state and government collapse, they will go on pretending that they're not at war with Ukraine and that they still want a diplomatic solution and are prepared to negotiate with the Ukrainian government. They will pitch it at the level where they will insist on conditions which the Ukrainian government will never accept. But... That's what they will do. And the reason they will do that is because it puts them in a much stronger diplomatic position and also in a stronger position at home. So I don't think we're going to see a formal declaration of war. By the way, I may be wrong, but I don't think there's been any formal declaration of war by any country in any conflict since the end of the Second World War. Just saying. Neurosurgery Highland says, West is stoking the fire to get World War III, high interest rates, non-inflation, but war bonds. Well, I hope you're wrong. Um, I can see why you're saying that. But if we are heading towards a World War III situation, then war bonds are not going to be of any help to anybody. Because in a World War time, World War III situation, to be straightforward about it, the effects are potentially so catastrophic that there will be no one to pay those bonds and nobody to redeem those bonds at any time. So I, I, I and there'll be no time to spend any of the money raised by these war bonds. But you know, I, I'm not discounting entirely what you say. There are some very troubled people, very disturbed people in Washington, and you know, they're capable of some extraordinary things. Aladje47, thank you for that super sticker. Mr. Wonderful says, Russia has to unleash its full military now or be dragged on for years, allowing the West to rearm the Ukraine continuously. Well, continually. I, I continually. Well, look, I, I'm not going to discuss the second part of your point because I don't know to what extent the West can, in fact, do that. And there's growing issues about this. I mean, we'll probably be discussing this in a specific video but the whole saga for the for example of tank deliveries is now becoming bizarre with Ryan Metal the maker of the leopard 2 saying you know that they can't that it would take them at least a year almost a year to provide leopard 2s to Ukraine if um, you know they were asked to produce either refurbish old ones or produce new ones and all kinds of things like that going on so you know I, I'm not going to get into that at this point. But on the first point, all the indications are that the Russians are heading towards some big knockout blow soon. Now, I, you know, I, I'm not able to tell you what the Russian leadership is thinking, but we're seeing hundreds of thousands of troops deployed, hundreds of tanks being deployed, thousands of armored vehicles, vast numbers of artillery, missiles. Well, presumably, they're all to some purpose. Ryan says, can you please discuss the religious aspect of the war? As an American Orthodox Christian, I would like to point out the role of Patriarch Bartholomew has played in the war with his schism. 
This is a difficult subject for, I think, both of us, uh, certainly for me as a Greek Orthodox Christian. Suffice to say that Ukraine historically has been divided on religious lines and the majority of people in what was, say, Tsarist era Ukraine, which includes Kiev, Vinitsa, all of these places in the center of Ukraine, are are historically orthodox and they've been historically part of the Russian Orthodox Church. In Western Ukraine, much of it controlled first by the Habsburgs and then by Poland, there is the Uniate Church, uh, which is a church that follows or pursues or has adopted some orthodox rites, but which accepts the Pope as the superior um, you know, religious leader. So there's been a division. And what has happened um, over the last few years, and looking back, it's a clear sign that this is a countdown to a war. Within Ukraine, there have been a relatively small number of ex-priests or rival priests who set themselves up as a specifically orthodox Ukrainian rival to the established Orthodox Church, which has retained some links to Russia and to the Moscow Patriarchate. Well, about two years ago, the Patriarch of Constantinople, the Ecumenical Patriarch, um, announced that he was recognizing this, gr this group as the official Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Now, this he did without consulting with other members of the Orthodox community. And uh, many people, myself, were very upset about that. Um, I saw it as an overt interference by the Patriarch in a political conflict. It was very clear to me that he was doing this on, under American pressure. And there's been all kinds of suggestions as to why he did it. And, you know, whether he was pushed into doing it or bribed into doing it. I'm not going to go into all of that, but I think it was completely wrong. And what has happened since is that the Ukrainian authorities, backed by the Western powers, none of which are, of course, orthodox, including the United States, have been both promoting this official Orthodox Church, as the Patriarch of Constantinople has recognized it as the true Orthodox heretical Church of church. Ukraine, the heretical church, exactly. They've been heretical seizing, church. Church. they've been seizing, church. Church. it's a heretical yeah, church. Yes, a heretical, they've been seizing all these properties. They've been declared, uh, the, the, a Ukrainian government official has now openly said that the only Orthodox Church that's going to be allowed in Ukraine is this church, in which all services must be conducted in Ukrainian with all of these, as I said, schismatic, heretical priests. And to my great shame and dismay, the United States, uh, in alliance with the Patriarchate of Constantinople and the Greek government, has been promoting the interests of this heretical church, this schismatic church across the Orthodox world. So we have a split within Orthodoxy in Ukraine, and I'm afraid it's now spreading across the Orthodox world as well. Now, I find this a very difficult subject to discuss. It's caused me a great deal of distress. It also further shows the extent to which Greece has turned its back on its historical connection to Russia, its friendship to Russia as a fellow Orthodox country, and as a Greek as well, that has dismayed me about the situation with, um, with uh, the future of Greece. But the important thing to stress about this religious division in Ukraine is that it is a purely artificial one. This did not come from within the Orthodox community of Ukraine. There was no demand from them to break away from the proper, the true Orthodox Church. This was agreed by the US Embassy, the Patriarch of Constantinople, certain officials of the Greek government, 
uh, 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 and and people like that. So I don't think it is true to say that there is a religious conflict in Ukraine, except, as I said, at the official level. In fact, what there is, as far as I'm concerned, is a persecution by the authorities in Ukraine, who are not, in my opinion, Christians, of the true Orthodox Church of Ukraine. I don't know whether Alex has anything to add to this story. No, I'll just tell Ryan that uh, we've done a lot of videos on this topic. Uh, if, if you go back to our archive and just do a search, I guess put Orthodox uh, Church in our video search, and you'll find that we've covered this topic. Uh, most notably, we did these videos way before the uh, February 24th uh, special military operation started. So this was being cooked up way before any uh, military conflict was getting underway, which I think is more proof to the point that uh, the, the preparations to provoke Russia were well underway before the actual fighting started. I because what this is at the end of the day is just a way for the, uh, for the collective West to, uh, to provoke Russia and to remove any type of, uh, of Russian, Russian culture. In, uh, in Ukraine. That's why they created this heretical church, which, like you said, they just created it out of thin air. There wasn't a need or a movement or a desire to create another Orthodox uh, church. Absolutely. Can I just so. also say that the way this topic has been covered in parts of the Western media has been horrifying, with the Guardian newspaper in Britain in particular actively supporting these attacks on the Orthodox church in um, uh, Ukraine and talking about the fact that it's supposedly run by Russian spies, which is bizarre. And of course, if you follow The Guardian well, as I do, you know that it has a very strong anti-Christian bias anyway. So here we see them involving themselves in this quarrel. And um, well, I find those articles also very upsetting and distressing to read. All right. From uh, Tired Looking for a Name, uh, are you familiar with the works of Peter Zeihan on geopolitics? And if you are, what is your opinion? You know, I've been asked this question before, and the answer is I'm not. Stay quickly on that, because uh, on of all that string of things about the Russian demographic collapse, I actually saw a study about this. I think Alex probably saw it as well, where, in fact, it now turns out the birth rate in Russia is higher and the population balance is better in Russia than in any other European country. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I'm not sure about this, but, you know, you get conflicting views. I, I do think, by the way, that this demographic thing is basically, with Russia, is basically over. The, it's stabilised and recovered and will probably grow. Just, just saying, because it was one of the things that I often get asked about. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a bonkers interview. Bonkers, like bonkers. interview. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, you know, what, what we can go. you do? Uh, Wendy Sheets, thank you for that super sticker. George Proud, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Yerasimov says uh, Yerasimov. Toilet sauce says Yerasimov was always Sudovikin's superior. All that changes is that Yerasimov, who is basically the man who wrote Russia's military doctrine, is becoming much more involved. I completely agree. I mean, I think that's what we've been saying in our various programs. I think that's entirely right. It's also a sign that, as I said, something big is coming. Yeah. Um, per Persuader Tron says missile campaign has another role, activate and identify all Ukraine air defenses and mobile unit movement patterns. I completely agree with that. That's entirely correct. And uh, we're seeing signs of that, that the Russians are now attacking um, Ukrainian air defense positions as well. Uh, Meg, thank you for that super sticker. Danny Mutando says, already wrote. Thank you for that, Danny. And Ricardo Afonso says, most weapon businesses rely only on paid lip service about leaving. They're mostly still doing business in Russia. Anya K and Sergei Baklikov go to Russian malls and give updates. I, I've heard this as well. In fact, people, uh, I know a business person who works in Russia who tells me exactly that. There are a lot of these companies that supposedly sold out their businesses in Russia and left. The, the people who are actually running them in Russia are 
privately running them on behalf of the Western owners. I cannot confirm that. I'm not going to go there because this isn't something I can really either prove or disprove. The only thing that really matters is the fact that all of these businesses, all these operate are still operating in Russia, whether under new Russian owners or covertly on behalf of Western owners, who knows? But it's not had the effect on the Russian economy that many people in the West expected. Joe Region, thank you for that super sticker. Michael, thank you for that super sticker. Radovid, thank you for that super sticker. Asox says, great guest in live show. Thank you for that. Abby123 says, hi, some, some say the war is a failure of diplomacy. Is Russia's SMO a failure of diplomacy or did they never stand a chance? Well, I think that is a, that's a very good question, but I don't think I don't think diplomacy failed. I think diplomacy was deliberately sabotaged. I mean, when people like Merkel and Hollande come along and say that the whole point about the Minsk II agreement was to buy Ukraine time so it could rearm, well, it's absolutely clear that on the Western side, there was no interest in diplomacy, because that is not diplomacy. That is the opposite of diplomacy. You can't expect diplomacy to succeed when one side, Russia, engages in it and the other side doesn't. Diplomacy requires both parties to work towards at least some kind of objective which they can both share. If there isn't that goodwill there, there isn't that, that intention there, then there is no possibility for the success of diplomacy. So it's not a failure of diplomacy because diplo that would suggest that this was somehow something that you know, people tried to do and it didn't quite work out and it was all went wrong. This was a deliberate sabotage of an effort to achieve peace. Stephen Mason says, Dear Alexander, what is the agreement called that was made at the end of the Cold War, which is supposed to prevent the U.S. and Russia from placing nuclear weapons on each other's doorsteps? Thanks. You actually yeah, I, I actually answer. answered that during the program. And in fact, yeah. uh, Stephen Mason has been in contact with me. And since the interview with Larry Johnson, the, 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 but can I just say, just to repeat again, it's the International Nuclear, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty of 1987, if my memory serves me rightly. Uh, Fender Strat says, thanks for your wonderful current affairs programming, programming, something I've missed for so long. I appreciate the hard work you all do. Perhaps in 2023, you can try and explain the UK, Japan, chicanery and Indochina in general. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> complex topic. Um, uh, to be honest, if you're talking about Britain and Japan, well, Either you're talking about the historical events leading up to the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to uh, five, possibly, or, or if you're talking about today, I don't think the British and the Japanese really have very much involved with each other. But it's a big topic. British-Japanese relations are an interesting topic altogether. And at the moment, they're perhaps not as intense or as close as they've been. But there have been times when Japan and Britain in the past were actually military allies, and they were military allies against, China, against Russia. Sanjeva says, I think YT is making it difficult for all the like votes and views to be counted. For some channels, the view count has been static for a while now. Has anybody else noticed, which is never the case for a live stream? Well, can I just yes, say, we, uh, we have noticed. We have <laughs> I mean, that's all I get to say about this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we noticed. Thank you, Sanjeva, for that. Frank O'Reilly, thank you for that super chat. Commander Crossfire says, Slava, Ukraine. The ghoulish occupiers have been driven from Solidar. We have the momentum. Soon Kiev itself will be liberated onwards to victory. Yeah. Well, thank we'll see. Commander Crossfire. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tony Nevis. <laughs> Tony Nevis says, love you guys. What's the deal with the Yerasimov swap? Also, can Alex please link articles or interviews under his videos? It helps to share around. Okay. Well, I'm not I mean, sure if you mean it, my videos are Alexander's. Yes. Alexander's, we put the links. Yes, I know. I mean, in the description box. Yes, yes. I mean, we, we, we do it. We do it when, you know, we, 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 um, 
quote articles i mean we don't always do it because some of them to be honest are also paywalled and there are issues about links about paywalled articles and some anyway i mean but we do do it let's let's put it like that but the gerasimov thing which is perhaps the one that's attracted the most attention i think this is a non-story if you're talking about the way the west has spun it they're trying to make out that suravikin failed so he's been replaced by Gerasimov, even though Surovikin is in fact still there. I think it was explained better by, was it Toilet Sauce earlier? That what you're doing is, <clears throat> you've had Surovikin, he was in post, he stabilized the situation on the fronts, he built all these enormous fortifications, he got the troops across the Dnieper from uh, um, <clears throat> Herson region, He's ground the Ukrainians down in Bakhmut. He's launched this big missile offensive against Ukraine, which has been clearly effective and successful. Now you have this massive assembly of um, big forces taking place in and around Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands of men are there. At some point, some kind of offensive is going to be launched. So what do you do? You bring in his, you bring in his boss. You bring in the man Gerasimov, who is best experienced and best positioned to command and manage this big offensive that's coming. And that's all there is to it, I think. I think Surovikin is still there. Gerasimov is there too. And I think that it doesn't ultimately change the hierarchy. Gerasimov has always been Surovikin's superior. But I think, as Larry was saying over the course of our program, it points to big things to come. Ricardo Alfonso says, Turkey didn't have a good experience with their leopard tanks in northern Syria. In fact, they had to withdraw them after taking massive losses. I've heard the same. In fact, I didn't have, we, we actually discussed it at the time when it happened. It was uh, uh, it was a disaster. Now, of course, it could be that the Turks were not using these leopard tanks effectively. That's no doubt what the Germans would say. But then why assume that Ukrainian troops who will be presumably receive less training than the Turks have received on their leopard tanks? Why assume that they will do any better? Everybody that I've spoken to is in agreement that Leopard 2s are no wonder weapon. They're not going to change the balance of the war. And uh, a German general, General Vard, has now come forward and said exactly the same. He says 100 Marders and 100 Leopard 2 tanks are not going to make any difference in the in affecting the outcome of the war. And Peskov, Putin's spokesman, has said that the Russians will burn them. Joanna, thank you for that super sticker. Paul Watson says the Duran is on my screen every day. Thank you. Thank you for that. Har Harvardian says, I've been following the Duran daily every every day since 2016. I shudder to think what my view on geopolitics would be without their incredible uh, work. Talk about red pill. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for that. Island Popsicle says, while the West tries to cling to its hegemony, the rest of the world is moving on. China just signed a deal to extract oil in Afghanistan, the location of the last neocon failure. 2023 is going to be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that entirely. I mean, I have nothing to add to that point. I think it's a good one. Will, Willem, thank you for that super sticker. Tom Bombaldi says, book smart, street smart. Thank you for that. Raphael says, Ukraine's territory, 600,000 square miles. What will 300 tanks do? What will two Patriot, Patriot M's do? The that, West is complete cuckoo. Russia is laughing. I completely agree. And in fact, this German general I was talking about, General Vlad, made exact Vlad, I should say not Vlad, General Vlad made exactly that same point. He said, you know, a couple of hundred tanks isn't going to change the whole course of the war when, you know, if you look at the scale of the forces that are being um, engaged. One just one delivery of tanks from Russia to its forces numbered 200 tanks. That was just one delivery. And I read a report somewhere that the U.S. has assessed that one tank factory in Russia is capable of producing a 1,000 tanks a year. 
and that Russia has around 10,000 tanks in store. So 100 tanks may sound like, you know, to a Harbeck and Baerbock and Sunak and all these people as if, you know, it's a big thing, but it's not going to make any difference. Ricardo Alfonso says, this is like the fable of the hare and the tortoise. The hare believed he couldn't lose, and the tortoise just persevered and eventually won. I think it's, again, a very good point, actually. Christopher, thank you for that. Christophe. Christophe, thank you for that super sticker. Number one fan, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says, U.S. schools removed shop class by, by 20 years ago. Millennials and Gen Zs can't hammer a nail, much less know one end of a screwdriver from the other. Well, indeed. Well, you know, there was a very interesting interview by the French uh, sociologist, um, Emmanuel Todd, one of the most interesting people writing about global affairs. He wrote some very fine books about this in the past. And he made a very interesting point. He says that the United States um, has a student body that's about more than twice as big as the Russian. This is relative, you know, it's population. Only 7% of American students study engineering, whereas 25% of Russian students study engineering. And that translates to Russia producing in any given year 30% more engineers than the United States does. That's what Todd said. I don't know that his figures are correct, but I get that sense that that's true. And I think Larry, who has written and discussed this many times, is also of that view overall. Roman V says, Le Cirque du Zelay. Zelensky, Le Cirque du Zelensky. <laughs> Thank you for that. The Noah name says that Durant's credibility goes up 100% every time Larry shows up. He's the best in the business. Thank you for that, Noah. John Flanders says, I trained as a machinist. I gave up the trade thanks to the ridiculous pay and constant layoffs in the United States. I agree with you. I've heard so many people say that. In Britain, by the way, it's even worse. Thank you for that. Summer of 1970 says, the empire of lies will fail. Only question is how much damage will it do before the end? Mm, yeah. Commando Crossfire says, what are Russia's weak, weak or vulnerable points in Ukraine and other operation? They aren't invincible. Is there a move that could undercut their advance? We'll well, I think we this, just, I talked actually. about this on the program. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, Ninius Z says, the U.S. has never fought a real war. All of their equipment is for marketing purposes only. The U.S. military would not last three months in a real war. All right. I, I, I have to take issue with you on one point. The United States has fought real wars. The American Civil War or the war between the states was a very real war. And at the conclusion of it, I know quite a few people who believe that by 1865, a long time ago, the United States had the best armed forces and the most modern command system in the world. And that carried over. I mean, you know, they, they learned all kinds of things. They developed all kinds of structures and ways of thought and understanding of war, which, again, if you follow the U.S. in the Second World War, the, CO the U.S. did some amazing things at the Second World War, particularly the Pacific, actually, where the naval war that the United States fought in the Pacific was a brilliant one. But what we have seen over the last 50 years, perhaps even longer, is a situation of failed ventures. And I'm going to suggest that the reason for this is not because of, and it did not originate with problems with the military. It is that the political demands that the political leadership have been making of the US military have been completely unrelated to reality. So that the military has been repeatedly asked to do things which no military, however well-trained, can actually do, can actually achieve. And that has resulted in the complete distortion, and if you like, corruption of the American military system, which is why we have the military system that we have today with the very outcome that you say. In other words, today, the United States probably doesn't have the kind of military 
that could sustain the sort of war which we are now seeing in Ukraine. Now, having said that, that was not always the case. It is, as I said, bad policy making which has led us there. TT, thank you for your super sticker. Ricardo Alfonso says propaganda has its uses, but when it becomes incongruent with the facts on the ground, then you will lose your public's support. No one will believe you. How do you recover from that? Ukrainians are freezing, are realizing this very quickly. I think you're absolutely it's right. And it's an extremely good point, actually. Commando Crossfire says, I don't see an advance from Belarus. That looks like building a response force to intercept any NATO incursion, a more and more likely scenario. You know, I have to say I agree. But, of course, as I said many times, what the Russian command is thinking, well, they don't share with me. Yeah. From Sanjiva, Russian indecisiveness in the beginning of the SMO, counting on the rationality of the West did cost significantly for Russia. I was told that there are still some in Moscow who fail to realize that the West has maximalist ambitions. I think did, I think we might have discussed this point. We, we, but we talked get, about this. We, yeah. we talked about yeah, we this, yeah, I think, this, yeah. yes. Yeah. Island Popsicle says, the U.S. isn't the land of the free anymore. It's the land where people want free stuff and distractions. We're living in a brave new world. There's something in that. And of course, I think the reference to brave new world is in fact to a, a brilliant novel by Aldous Huxley. Um, from the 1920s, which did refer to a consumerist dystopia run by an authoritarian government, which, which um, controlled populations through effectively genetic manipulation. It's quite an extraordinary novel, very, very insightful to read. So I, 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 I think you are right in saying that there is some elements of that in the West today. I do still hope that we will find a way back. Vasil Beshkov, thank you for that super sticker. Jeff Bickford says, very informative. Thank you. Alex Glanz, thank you for that super sticker. Christoph Von Madak, thank you for that super sticker. CSK4J, thank you for that super sticker. Kanwan F8 says, the US has passed from a clockwork orange and gone straight to 90, 1984 and the brave new world and heading straight towards Dr. Strangelove. Well, you're, you're, you're putting it beautifully. Right. Beautifully. I have nothing to add to that. Uh, San, San Shin, thank you for that super sticker. Powell 6260, thank you for that super sticker. Commander Crossfire says, can Russia, Russia's economy stand indefinitely the sanctions? Yes. I think I think we're past the point now um, of um, crisis. If it was going to break down and buckle under the sanctions, it would have done so by this point. I think with every passing month that the sanctions, uh, you know, that the, the Russian economy stands and grows, it becomes more san sanctions resistant. I think this view that some people have that the sanctions are a long term thing that's going to eventually bring down the Russian colossus, are, are, are getting it completely wrong. I think it's the other way around. Kyle Wille, thank you for that super sticker. Nick Brachkovich, thank you for that super sticker. Nina Z says Merrick Garland just appointed a special counsel into the Biden docs. <laughs> the kind of program about this, that. yeah. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Da yes, David Franco Jr. says, do you guys think we are underestimating the proclivity of large portions of Western populations to not only believe but embrace obvious lies. Well, can I just say, I have certainly underestimated it in the past. When we were doing on the Duran our Russiagate coverage, our, our breakdown of Russiagate, I mean, I, I, I think I said many times, actually, I said, this is so absurd. This is so ludicrous. This is so based upon not fact, but hysteria, that there will come a point when eventually it just has to collapse and credibility has to go. Well, we've never reached that point. And in fact, most of the people I knew who believed in Russiagate still know, still believe in Russiagate, despite the massive accumulation of evidence that points in the other direction. So, you know, I, I'm not going to say that people will always remain fooled, but I have to say, I am very disillusioned at how long it is taking for people to, uh, uh, you know, 
understand that, you know, they've been told things which are completely not true. Commander Crossfire says, are we starting to see infighting or divisions in Russia that could compromise the military campaign or public cohesion? Right. I'm going to say this because it's a point that a lot of people have discussed. And by the way, Peskov, the um, Putin spokesman, has actually talked about it today. He's denied, first of all, that there's any divisions or any dissension within Russia at all. The Ministry of Defense and Prigozhin, for example, are the best of friends, if you believe Peskov. There's no argument, no quarrel. I think that in every single war that has ever been fought, you will find strong personalities who clash with each other. I think this war is no different. I'm sure there have been arguments and quarrels at the top of the Russian leadership. Does that make any difference to the outcome of the war? No, it doesn't. I think ultimately they're all focused on one thing, which is achieving victory. So, you know, there'll be maneuvers, there'll be things like, you know, Montgomery versus Eisenhower or Montgomery versus Patton that we saw in the Second World War. Did that change anything? No, in the end, it didn't. New 2 says, thanks, guys, doing good. Thank you for that. Uh, Leonid Golichev says, viva Duran. Andre, thank you for that super chat. Ernest Gibson, thank you for that super chat. Irina says, how was it possible that ex-cons from Varonish pushed NATO trained and well-equipped Ukrainians from Solidar? That's an excellent question. That's a very good question. Yeah. Stream, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ruben Botero says the deep state is trying to pressure Biden to do something he doesn't want to do in Ukraine, perhaps boots on the ground or a false flag. Why are you so sure that he doesn't want to do it? <laughs> I would say, if anything, the arguments point in the opposite direction. I'd say that um, Biden is not ultimately the ultimate decision maker, but I think his instincts always are to escalate. And I think that's why he's been so willing to listen to people like Sullivan and Blinken, who are extreme hardliners. I think there are some elements within the US government, partly part of the deep state, who are urging restraint. But I don't get the sense that Biden in this matter has been any kind of force of restraint at all. Joe Tacoma, thank you for that super chat. Sparky says, university rewards those who focus, but often those who focus can't see the forest for the trees. Now they're oh, it's, in leadership. This is completely true. And can I just say, uh, uh, um, the quality, the, the nature of university training has actually made people's minds narrower than they used to be. Uh, it's doing the opposite of what university training used to do. And I speak as the husband of an academic. JJHW says the locals chat is down. Tom Babadil says in World War II, the Japanese claim the U.S. Marines were recruited from jails and insane asylums. Maybe that's not a bad place to look for troops. Well, you know, again, I, 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 I take the point. But I mean, it, it's well known that, you know, boys who are, shall we say, you know, for, restless often end up in the army and steady and do well there and i think actually um larry actually said over the course of the program that you know in some cases boys who got into trouble in the united states in historically were offered the option of going into the military and many did and found their way you know i there's nothing really that new about this and of course the french foreign legion historically has you know regularly recruited people who've had criminal backgrounds. So I've been worried about it. Elza says, I've been missing your lives during the last weeks. Thank you for your great work, gentlemen. Thank you, Elza, for that. Uh, Tahir says, while we are talking about Russia's success, do you think there, there will be something crazy coming from the Ukraine and the US to change the narrative? <laughs> Well, yes, it's very likely indeed, but I'm not going to try and guess what that will be because that's a hopeless end undertaking. But, you know, we've discussed this before. Alex is particular, has been, you know, met, discussing this many times. They have going to have a very big narrative problem 
to some extent, they already do. And, you know, they're going to have to come up with something <laughs> to change the narrative uh, when the, you know, the existing one collapses around them. But, you know, I'm not going to try to guess what that's going to be. And finally, Gus Antunes, thank you for that super sticker. And that is everything. Thank you very much for all of your questions. Great live stream.